Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Ventana Wildlife Society's The Condor Chat, which occurs on the last Thursday of the month, or most months. Uh, holidays uh, change, changes that schedule slightly, but good to see you all here. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have a full hour schedule for you today. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. You know, we've been talking a lot about highly pathogenic avian influenza, and for good reason. It's extremely scary disease. It is still uh, essentially raging across the country. We're hearing about it in chicken farms. We're hearing about it in cattle now. We're, we're seeing the disease showing up in uh, all kinds of strange places. It's uh, primarily spread by uh, birds and the transmission of, of uh, fecal material close contact. Uh, thankfully, we still have not detected it in the condor population here in California. But as most of you know, there was a horrible outbreak that occurred uh, in Arizona, uh, which, which took the lives of 21 condors. And so we've been working extra hard to get uh, quarantine pens set up. And in today's update, Joe and the crew will, will uh, give you some more details about that. But essentially, uh, I'm just really excited about it because it increases our capacity to be able to vaccinate more condors at a time. And of course, our goal is to vaccinate every single condor in the wild flock here in Central California. Uh, and given the fact that we have 100 free-flying condors, that's no easy task. And the crew's been working around the clock in some cases and really working hard to uh, get us uh, better prepared to handle this disease. On a more uplifting note, uh, I think this year's nesting season is shaping up to be one of the best ever. So really excited to, to hear from Joe and the crew more about, uh, about that. And uh, um, I guess uh, lastly, uh, hopefully by now you've seen uh, the streaming camera that explore.org provides trained on the outside of a redwood nest down in Big Sur. It's Redwood Queen's nest. She's nesting with Zenith this year, and together they have the cutest little chick. And today we're going to ask you to help us name that chick. So if you haven't seen the cam, be sure to check that out. You can find it on our website under uh, live cams under the condor section. There's three different cameras running at all times. And the one I'm referring to right now is the Redwood Nest. Uh, it's operating uh, primarily in the middle part of the day because it relies on solar power to charge up batteries. So the best time to check it out would be, say, you know, 11 to 2 or something like that. But uh, Joe will give us more details on that. And as the summer uh, gets further along and we have more sun throughout the day, we can leave the camera on uh, even longer. And it's just so exciting to see uh, this this veteran pair, especially Redwood Queen. She's uh, approximately 26 years old, so she's she's a tried and true mother and uh, just doing an awesome job out there. And it's just really exciting to watch them raise this chick live. So I hope you've uh, already seen that and, and we'll watch it all the way until this fall when, when the chick is expected to, to fledge. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Joe. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, and uh, welcome back, everyone. We're excited to update you on what happened the past month. As always, we got a lot to report. Um, we have been super busy, and uh, yeah, we have a full full agenda today. Um, as Kelly was mentioning, the photo on the right there, we're pretty excited to talk about Redwood Queen. Anytime we can talk about her, it's a good thing, and uh, she has a new a new addition, and uh, we're going to help name that new addition today. Um, but yeah, for the agenda, I'm going to go through the Big Sur rebuild and the vaccine update and what's happening to SPCA Monterey. Um, big shout out to those guys. We're going to talk about the rookie update, um, population status. Uh, Darren's going to get into nitty gritty on the nesting. Um, and then we'll finish it with the naming poll. So we're all pretty excited to give this chicken name. Um, as I was saying, the crew is uh, 
just been knocking it out of the park. I just want to definitely recognize them. Darren's here today. Darren Gross, Danae, Mouton, and Kara Fadden are not here, um, but they are definitely want to be recognized. Uh, everybody has just stepped up huge. And again, um, we have Mike Stake here. What's up, Mike? <laughs> and uh, Mike's going to help with questions, but uh, Mike's out been beating the streets, giving out non-lead ammo, which is uh, one of our big, uh, obviously one of our big goals to get hunters and ranchers to switch over to non-lead to protect condors. Um, yeah, and also, you know, it does take a village. I want to give a uh, shout out to Evan, our GIS Evan McGreeth, our GIS specialist, he produced a really awesome map, one of his classic maps today, um, what the rookies have been up to. And of course, Tim Huntington, awesome volunteer and behind the scenes database control designer, you know, our, our all of our data runs through the app he designed. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and of course, big time right now is our veterinary advisor, Amy Wells, Dr. Amy Wells. So we are leaning on her big time right now. And of course, our awesome crew of volunteers. Uh, we had folks come out to help out with SBCA, and then we have folks out helping tracking. It's pretty awesome just to be acquainted with these folks and just see the passion they have. So all around, big thank yous to the crew and everyone. Um, without further ado, let's get into this. Let's get going. The rebuild is going awesome. Um, that's the cabin there. We're heavy into fire clearance right now. Uh, we've gone from really wet to it is drying out fast. So our goal is to give the cabin and the condor release pen um, a wide berth from any potential fire. So that is our number one focus right now, as well as they are wrapping up the exterior, doing some fireproofing underneath the eaves of the building. That's the top right photo. Um, and then they're actually about to pour the ADA uh, ramp off the back of the cabin. And so uh, things are coming together on the exterior. And then on the interior, we have um, power going in and all that good stuff. So yeah, things are moving along. And uh, yeah, and we're, we're expecting to get on a good clip this summer and have this thing wrapped up and have the crew using it by fall. So um, yeah, we're pretty excited. HPI update, you know, Kelly was touching on it. It is definitely um, ripping in different areas and it's recently gotten into cattle. Um, I read a story this morning, they're calling 4.5 million chickens in Iowa. Um, it's a big deal. It's uh, having a major, not only wildlife impact, um, livestock impact, you know, just uh, agricultural, just economic impact on the United States. So pretty significant. And of course, we're, our goal is to get, you know, the 100 endangered condors we have here in Central California vaccinated as soon as we can. And we're happy to report we have 18 of 100 now vaccinated, 18%, um, easy to do the math there. So uh, we're getting there, but we have a ways to go. And now uh, the last update we had planning to vaccinate four to eight juveniles. Now we can say eight. We finished building the additional four pins. And so we're focused again on juvenile and sub-adults. Um, and again, it's a month long uh, treatment where they get the first vaccine, we wait three weeks and then they get the booster and then we wait a week, do a health check and then let them back out in the wild. And again, for because it's nesting season, we're holding off on adults. Um, if we did happen to catch adult, we would uh, do what we needed to for what we normally do for transmitters and um, blood draws, but we would get that bird right back out in the wild and just give it one shot. And again, it's just going to be opportunistic because we don't want to disrupt um, the nest flow, you know, how they're taking care of their chicks and all that. And we're estimating the vaccinating, you know, doubling the, the our ability at uh, SPCA is going to definitely move up the timeline a bit, which is or shorten the timeline. So we're hoping to get, you know, obviously under two years, get all these birds vaccinated um, if all goes smooth. And we are happy to report we just got... Um, these four out back out and flying. We're gonna have more details about that, but they just completed their vaccinations. Um, 1089, oops, sorry. Uh, 1089 were released back into the wild um, in early May on 510. And 1085, who when we trapped for vaccination, found out he actually had a elevated lead, was treated successfully at Oakland Zoo and fully vaccinated and released on, he was held a couple weeks longer to deal with the lead. But they lowered their lead, lowered his lead, and gave him his vaccination. He was released on five sixteen, 
and Meredith put together some really cool, very Meredith Evans, our communications coordinator, put together some awesome videos. Um, here's one of, uh, it's updating. Well, actually, I'll let, let the video speak for itself and everybody enjoy. Hey everyone, my name is Darren Gross. I'm a biologist with, with Ventana Wildlife Society. Uh, we're here today uh, at our SPCA quarantine site for the California condors that we're giving uh, vaccinations to for highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, today we're giving the second dose of the vaccine and this will be part of their sort of ending process here. After this, we'll monitor them for a few days, make sure they're okay, give them another checkup, put their transmitters back on as long as everything looks good, and then release them back into the wild and they'll be good to go. Hey everyone, Joe Burnett here with Ventana Wildlife Society. We're back at SBCA. It's the final day for the birds that have been here, 1089, 1145, and 1095. We're excited to get them out today. We're gonna put on their transmitters. And there we go, blah, blah. Dr. Amy Wells is gonna give them one final exam. And then Pinnacles will take them over to the Pinnacles National Park and release them later this afternoon. So this is our first batch of birds that we've vaccinated. So we're happy to say all went well. And thank you everyone for the support. Big shout out to SBCA, of course, and all of our supporters. Thank you everyone and we'll keep you posted. Um, yeah, and again, a big shout out to, uh, Oakland Zoo, um, here they are, uh, treating, this is during his treatment at lead poisoning. He kind of got the double whammy, he had to get the vaccine and then had to go in for treatment, but that's why our partners are so important. You know, I keep saying it takes a village and we really rely on, um, Oakland Zoo to help out and, uh, they always step up to the plate. So big, uh, big thank you to them. Um, and then we have another video. This is a cool one of Darren. Uh, maybe you can kind of prep this one, Darren. Sure. So yeah, the, this release day, May 16th, um, I first drove up to Oakland zoo to, to pick up 1085 and yeah, the, the vets up there, just gave him a quick look over. He was good to go, got his radio transmitter back on. And then I drove him right down to Pinnacles national park, uh, where the other three birds that we had vaccinated, uh, were also released almost a week earlier. Um, and yeah, I met up with one of the pinnacles biologists, Caitlin Lopez. And yeah, we, we drove up to the spot, this like perfect spot up, uh, up in the mountains, um, there were, uh, where they release birds and, uh, yeah, I'll just let the video do the rest, but yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. Hey, and Derek, can you mute so we don't get an echo effect on the sound? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah, big shout out to Caitlin for taking such an awesome video. That was sweet. I know, that was that was really really nice camera work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was interesting. Um, I love he kind of took his. I like how he took his time. You know, going out, he got out and kind of got his bearings. But you could see that turkey vulture off in the distance. You, you can almost see him gauging the wind. He's like, oh okay, and then uh, off he went. But you know, the other thing I noticed, Darren, is he's starting to show a little yellow on his beak. Yep. So the, he's yeah. maturing quickly, you know, for those of you that watched our live releases, uh, watching Wild Bill, he was, <laughs> he was one of the last ones to go out um, on that infamous release day and uh, has been doing great ever since. But it's just, it's amazing, you know, it's almost like I have two kids and just watching how fast they grow up, you know, that's what everybody says. And it's the same with these condors, you know, when we work with them day to day, year to year, it's pretty crazy to see how fast they grow up, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of our lower 1,000 birds are already basically have a full on pink head. Um, it's it's crazy just to see that all lined up. Yeah, but awesome too because that means they're getting closer to breeding age, which is mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. So yeah, building more pens at SPCA. Oh. Um, Real quick, Joe, are we uh, back on normal uh, Zoom mode or in unoptimized from the video? Yeah, thank you for the heads up. Yeah. Does it seem normal? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Just double check. Yeah, thanks for checking on that. <laughs> Always good to double check. Um, yeah, and again, big thank you to everyone that helped out. Uh, a lot of VWS staff chipped in. Um, Kelly was out there, um, Derek from non-lead, um, just a lot of folks. It was, it was pretty fun. A lot of hard work, but a lot of fun too, just to get out there and get everybody mixed up. We had the Pinnacles crew there and, um, folks from our education program came out. Big thank you to them. Um, and, uh, yeah, they got, a, got a little experience at using drills and <laughs> building, uh, building condor pins. So, um, it was pretty fun. And, uh, yeah, I think it was uh, a nice big morale boost for the whole for everyone involved gives you, you know, because the H pie thing is pretty scary. So to have these extra pins built now is just that much more makes us feel that much more safe, a little more hope there. So, um, yeah, we're, we're primed and ready. Here's pinnacles helping out. So yeah, the four pins are right near the other four. So we're at eight total and, uh, yeah, we look to, we're, we're still wrapping up doing some final, um, final adjustments on these four pens and then we will go into trap mode and we're hoping by uh mid-june ish uh to have uh the next round of eight birds in here for vaccinations so pretty exciting uh next step so yeah we'll keep everyone posted hopefully by the june chat we'll have birds with their first vaccinations awaiting their boosters fingers crossed uh, population update. We're looking good. We're at a hundred. Um, what Kelly touched on the exciting part is we are already at eight chicks in the nest. Um, unbelievable. Again, those birds have to make it to fledge as well, but, um, you know, knock on wood, uh, they, uh, they hold it through and we get, that would break a record for us, um, in terms of the number of chicks fledged in one year. So we're on track knock on wood to a record breaking year. And we still have a few, a couple of nests that could still hatch. Uh, we're going to get more into that later. Um, Darren's going to give us a lot more detail there, but yeah, pretty exciting. And, um, and we've got our rookies right around the corner, just a few months out, we'll be getting our next batch of release birds. Um, and it looks like we might get quite a few and, uh, they should be arriving at San Simeon, August, September. So we're, uh, we're already got that on our timeline as well, getting ready for the next batch. And uh, Darren and Kara and Danae are actually getting ready to interview the next two interns that'll be down there. Um, we're excited to see who comes to the project. So um, they'll be down there helping out with that. Um, Condor deaths, again, that's we're just being very cautiously optimistic. It's at zero, that could change quickly. Um, and you know, for perspective, we had nine last year, including the four missing. Uh, on top of that. So those missing birds are likely not going to show up. So for 2023, we, you know, 13 deaths is pretty, pretty harsh. So we're hoping uh, we can keep that number down this year. Obviously, if we can stay at zero, that would be incredible. Um, so yeah, again, keep your fingers crossed. The birds stay out of trouble. Anything you want to add, Darren? Uh, no, no, I think, um, yeah, just just I can't believe that the rookies are almost right around the corner <laughs> again. You know, we're about <laughs> to get, get into we're going to get into a, a rookie update on last year's rookies here shortly. But yeah, that that the next ones are coming up is is wild. But yeah, we're we're excited for that. Um, and then yeah, also just really excited to talk more about the nesting here in a few moments. Speaking of which, one of Evan's awesome maps. Yes, take it away, Darren. Yeah, yeah. So again, big shout out to Evan. Uh, he always gives us an awesome map and graphic for to, to share with you guys and talk to talk to you all about something cool about what these condors are doing and their movements. And so we're, we're highlighting rookie movements again uh, this month um, and really focusing in on one bird who had just had some really cool movements, but this kind of encapsulates what all of them uh, have been doing this past month and, and really just moving around and exploring more in this central California region. Um, so, so we're going to focus on Condor 1141 Willow, um, who, yeah, just, just had these awesome flights to different areas, kind of going back to San Simeon and then flying somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I'll just get right into it. So starting at the beginning of this month on, on May 5th, 
Um, Willow makes this significant flight east from the San Simeon release site down in the bottom left corner of the map there uh, and flying east over to the Kalinga area. Um, and yeah, this this was a pretty big flight for her, a 72-mile 70, flight, which is pretty impressive to see. Um, and then, yeah, kind of worked her way back to San Simeon. A few days later, she went back, she went back north up the Big Sur coast um to the Plaskett and willow creek area and she hung out there for a while like five days i think i don't think she was alone either i think we had some other rookies and other condors in that in that zone too just checking things out maybe maybe finding a carcass uh, to feed on um a little later in the month may 22nd um she's the first of the of last year's rookies the 10 rookies um to to make it to pinnacles national park um, and again, she spent some time there. She was spotted by one of the Pinnacles National Park biologists on May 24th, which was really cool to see. And then from there, she continued her way up to Hollister and, and got there just a few days ago on May 28th. Um, and yeah, again, this is 90 miles from San Simeon from where she was released and had really been spending most of her time the past uh, few months. So it was really cool to like see her and these other birds do these flights, just just really starting to explore and check out new areas. But Willow in particular was a was a great one to highlight, and we're stoked Evan uh, did this and, and could show show this for you all in this way. Just really cool to see. Yeah, this pattern we kind of see every year with these release birds, but that's a big flight. I mean, I don't think we've seen one this big um, this early that in a while. So big kudos to eleven forty one. All right, so getting into nesting. Um, yeah, I I'm, my mind's kind of spinning right now. There's so much to talk about <laughs> <laughs> with it, but that's a yes. good that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we're so stoked, and yeah, I want to make sure I do right by Danae here. I know this is her favorite thing, so yeah, getting getting right into it. No pressure, it. Darren. No pressure. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, starting with the Pinnacles nests here. Uh, so in total, Pinnacles has six nests this year, which is just awesome that they have this many nests that they're monitoring and following. Um, really, the big news from this table is, you know, all six nests have uh, all of their eggs have successfully hatched, um, which is just huge news that, you know, now they're now at this, like every nest there is at this chick stage. Um, it's just so cool to see. Uh, and yeah, the updates that are constant and it and it's great. We love it. Um, and yeah, to get into these these pairs and nests a little more. So first we have uh, 317 and 330 uh, who are actually brother and sister and they've they've tried nesting before and they successfully uh hatched a chick this year. This this chick uh, was hatched on April 7th and this is chick 1292. Um the nest the, the next nest um and paired to talk about is 692 and 726, Little Stinker. Um, and to give a little background on this pair, it, it's really cool. They, they've they been trying to nest successfully since 2019 uh, when 726 turned five years old, and which is uh, the breeding age uh, for condors. And this was the first year that they were successful. And, and we all just were beside ourselves when we got this news that, yeah, they successfully uh, hatched a chick this year. Uh, this is chick 1293. Uh, you can see in the photo um, that Pinnacle's biologist Gavin Emmons got. This is a great photo. Um, photo. Yeah. But yeah, we we're all just so excited for this pair and for this chick 1293. Um, really cool to, to see this and see them have success. Um, the next pair, 747 Boeing and 800, uh, they've nested previously before, um, but, and they've nested again this year and, uh, hatched chick 1308 and 1308 was hatched on April 29th. And then, yeah, we'll get into a little more detail on some of the other nests from Pinnacles in the next few slides. Um, so yeah, pair 569 Phoebe and 589, uh, this pair has nested four years in a row now and successfully raised chicks four years in a row. So this would be, uh, this would be the fourth, 1301. They, so since 2021, they've nested every year. Um, and yeah, 1301 uh, is 23 days old, was hatched on May 7th. And you can see these, see them flapping around a little bit in these, these photos that uh, Pinnacle's biologist, Caitlin Lopez was able to get. Um, and yeah, just, blowing our minds that, you know, there's a pair that's nested now four years in a row when they typically nest every other year. So this is just crazy. 
Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And I just want to emphasize that real quick, because you look at all of the books and all the literature, it all says the same thing. You know, they typically read every other year, um, but have the ability to nest consecutively two years in a row. Um, but this pair is doing something that uh, has never been documented before. And it's it's just absolutely amazing. I, I'm I'm just really... <laughs> Really excited that that this pair has figured that out, so to speak, and uh, bucking the norm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then uh, a new pair, a new nesting pair this year, and really first time nesters, uh, eight sixty eight and nine thirty one, Lady Lisa. Uh, they their chick successfully hatched on April seventh, and that that chick's stud book number is twelve seventy five. Uh, and yeah, that chick is is uh, one of our older ones now at one month and 23 days old, almost two months. Um, so yeah, it's growing up quick. Um, but yeah, really, again, great photo here um, from Pinnacles National Park that they were able to get of 1275 with mom, 931. And then uh, the the sixth nest I'll talk about from Pinnacles uh, is a trio, a new trio. And again, all, all first time nesters here. 888 Cedric, 889 Narcissa, and 913 Marie Antoinette. Um, and something that was, uh, yeah, just another thing that blew our minds about this and another nest this year is uh, this nest originally had two eggs. Um, the Pinnacles National Park biologists, when they first went to check on it, um, that top photo there, you know, they saw 913 uh, with two eggs. And so, um, that first egg lay uh, was on March 17th, and then the second egg lay was on March 27th. Um, when they returned a few days later on March 31st, they found that the, the first egg had failed. Uh, they just found uh, eggshell remains in the nest. Um, not sure what happened there, but the second egg was still still intact, still there and, and fertile. They checked it in. Uh, they found that that second egg was fertile, and it hatched on May 25th, and that is Condor 1310. And yeah, this the bottom photo here is uh, 889 Narcissa, um, sort of getting right back on that second egg after Pinnacles had just gone in and checked and 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 found that um, that first egg had failed, but that the second one was still all good. Yeah, because usually when you have two eggs like that, they both kind of get compromised. So it was it was cool to have one of them be fertile and make it, and then just you know this is hot off the press just a couple days, three days ago. You know the egg hatched, so. Pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. So Pentacles is on fire right now with six chicks. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the other thing though, I think is really interesting is that that was a trio and I guess, uh, Danae and, and some of, some of you on our team are, are looking into that right now. Um, and it appears that trios are more common in central California than anywhere else. And I really find that interesting. Yeah. I wonder That's why. <laughs> Um, yeah. you know, I have my own sort of got sus suspicions, but, uh, yeah, it's just really interesting. Anyway, I just yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it speaks a lot. I think lots of theories. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Big sir. Yeah. Big sir. So we're, we're, um, <laughs> we're doing pretty awesome over here too. Uh, we've got five nests uh, that are active. And we have confirmed for two of those nests that they have chicks. And for the other three, we strongly suspect they also have chicks. We just, for, for those other three nests, we um, some of them are very remote, uh, or it's just really hard for us to actually see into the cavity. Uh, if they have a chick and it's still really small, we can't actually see the chick yet. So we're still waiting on those other three nests to confirm that they have chicks. But um, for two of them, for sure, condors uh, or pairs, 729 and 626, and then 19650, we, we're uh, we've confirmed that those two uh, pairs have chicks now. Um, a bit of unfortunate news is that in this last month, we were able to confirm we had a new trio on the coast uh, with uh, condors 631, 745, and 970. And then not too long after, we also confirmed that that uh, trio had failed. Um, and so it, we we confirmed they failed by uh, just seeing, we, we noticed on our live cams that all three birds were showing up at the same time and spending a significant amount of time together. Um, and at that time too, in their nesting, when we estimated their egg lay, we suspected they still had an egg that the egg hadn't hatched yet. And really at that time, when for as much as we were seeing the trio together, uh, it, it just was pretty clear that they didn't, that they weren't taking care of an egg.
uh, or a chick anymore. Um, so yeah, we had that ch that nest both happen and and fail in the past month. Um, but yeah, getting a little more into the the active nests here. So condors 550 and 652 Ferdinand. Um, this is one of those nests that we suspect has a has a chick now, but we just haven't been able to confirm yet. But we suspect their egg hatched on April 24. Uh, Condors 190, Redwood Queen, and 650 Zenith. Um, we uh, we know their egg hatched on May 5th, and we can see that chick now, 1304, uh, on a live cam. We'll get into that a, a bit later. Um, but yeah, that chick is 25 days old and, and growing fast. Um, Condors 626 and 729, uh, their chick hatched on April 25th, and we recently got the stud book number for that chick. It is 1309. Um, and then 209 Shadow and 881 Minerva. Uh, this is another uh, nest that we suspect as a chick, just haven't been able to confirm yet, but we suspect their chick hatched on May 14th. Um, and yeah, this photo here, just to kind of show you how, how much we can monitor this, this chick for 190 and 650, uh, 1304. Uh, this photo in the slide was taken from that, just a screenshot from that cam today. So yeah, we're, we're getting daily updates and views of this chick to, to be able to monitor it. But yeah, a we'll quarter, talk about, quarter, about a quarter size of bomb. Yeah, yeah, cool. already, which is crazy. Uh, yeah, and then a new nest that we were able to confirm in this past month. Um, yeah, Danae was able to go out and and find the nest and confirm uh, that condors nine sixty two Sato and four seventy Fuego uh, were were incubating. Um, and and yeah, just just taking care of this egg and uh, we suspect now a chick. Um, yeah, we estimated the egg lay for March 25th and suspect that egg hatched uh, on May 20th. So yeah, we'll continue monitoring this this nest moving forward. And we're hoping as that as their chick gets bigger here, we'll be we'll start to be able to see it in this cavity. Uh, you can see from these great photos Danae got that. Um, first, I'll start with the photo on the right that that tree, this nest is like a broken off redwood like chimney nest. Um, with oh, an opening tops, at the top. yeah yeah um and yeah she was able to get 470 like coming out of the nest here and flying off and not too long after she saw 962 show show right up and go in um so yeah just a really cool observation and, and, and really good timing <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yes lucky. absolutely it was pretty awesome yeah but yeah just to highlight i mean so in total between big sur and pinnacles national park we have 11 active nests right now which is awesome um yeah, just the real huge. potential for 11 chicks, which is awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the nest cam, we were excited to get this going. It was a lot of work. Um, but fortunately, we had some of the pieces and parts up there from past nest cams and working close with explore.org. Um, they outfitted us with some new gear and we did some upgrades and got this cam up and running. There were some Obviously, there's always glitches when we get things going. Um, Kelly kind of touched on it. The, we've got this cam on a timer. It's down in the redwoods. It doesn't get a ton of sun. So we're trying to maximize the amount of time we can watch it um, through the timer. And that's going to increase as the sun gets higher. We get closer to summer solstice. Um, so I think next week, we're going to try to increase that um, cam a little longer throughout the day. Give it a couple more hours. A viewing time, which is um, as this chick grows, it's just going to get more and more exciting. For those that watched Aniko in this nest, uh, remember how exciting it was to watch uh, Aniko grow. So we're going to watch 1304 go through the same thing, and and hopefully we won't be calling it 1304 anymore. We'll be calling it a, a name. <laughs> so that's uh, one of the exciting parts about today. Um, and uh, yeah, I think... Uh, you know, this nest is pretty iconic. And this was the first nest in Big Sur, first nest in Central California. It involved Redwood Queen, of course, with her former mate, Kingpin, who we lost in the fire, but she is now repaired. Um, she repaired with Phoenix and now she's with Zenith and just keeps keeps on going. And it's pretty awesome. Um, talk about perseverance and um, resiliency. I mean, that captures it right you know i can't imagine what captures it better but uh pretty awesome to see see her back again with zenith and with their new edition and um let's see here i wanted to play some videos before we do the name so 
<laughs> Meredith uh, last minute put together some really cool, for those that haven't been able to tune in an SCAM, there's just some really, it's it's constant just entertainment. Um, watching 650, right, Darren? I mean, he's kind of, he's a new dad, a little bit clumsy at times. Um, he, this is a video clip when he was getting a little stir crazy and um, we were all cracking up. So I'm going to play this without further ado. It speaks for itself. Yeah, so he's a little clumsy. He's not exactly graceful. When you watch uh, Redwood Queen come in, it's like this majestic entry and very smooth. And um, so, yeah, I think dad's just working out the kinks a little bit. Um, but otherwise, I think uh, he's doing a great job. I mean, you couldn't. I think everyone that's watched just saw how um, how enduring he is with the chick and so gentle and um, feeding it almost around the clock. I think that's why that kick, chick is growing so fast. It's just getting fed constantly. And uh and then we have another video of just the chick itself. This one was equally cracking us all up. Um, and I'm gonna play that one real quick here. I mean, it doesn't get any cuter than that. That's that's a little white condor fluff ball. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, so now I think we're uh, yeah, we nicknamed that clip popcorn because he kept pop he or she kept popping around like a little kernel of popcorn in the nest, and uh, it's just pretty funny. So um, so here's our naming poll. So we went. We um, talked to our volunteers, our staff, and um, asked folks to name, you know, to to bring up some names, you know, iconic of Big Sur, you know, more of the natural, um, the biology, the plants, the animals. And these were the five that rose to the surface and that we're going to have you guys vote on today. Obviously, Monarch um, has a dual meaning. Um, obviously, it's for the Monarch butterfly, which is iconic um, along the Big Sur coast in California. And also Monarch ties in with Redwood Queen and um, the hierarchy there. And uh, of course, fern, ferns dominate the Redwood canopy, um, underneath the Redwood canopy. When you're hiking to any condor or Redwood nest, you go through fields of ferns. Same with the Sorrel um, right there. And uh, really common um, plants to us biologists out there walking around and folks that have been in the the redwoods and then of course we had the unique event aurora the aurora borealis event which hasn't happened in california or been seen in california for years so we thought that was a, a really uh appropriate potential name um should be on the list and then of course the uh iris which grows in the redwoods um that's the douglas iris am i right kelly right yeah and uh so yeah the those these uh Five names kind of hit the mark for everybody on staff. And uh, we want to leave it up to you folks to pick the final name. So we're going to have these five choices come up. I'm going to start a poll and we're going to let it go for um, a few minutes. And hopefully we got 138 participants. Hopefully we'll get at least 130 votes in and uh, we can uh, call it at that point. So I'm going to get this poll going. 
All right, here we go. Everybody get ready. Get your uh, clickers, your mouse ready. This is it. I'm going to launch it. Here we go. Everybody see it? Oh, Monarch and Aurora. Oh, we got a close race here. <laughs> so, by the way, I think you're the only one that can see the results. I don't think any of us can. Oh, that's right. When so I end it, I'll share. Yeah, I'll no give you a little tip. Yeah, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Darren, do you want to add anything about those names? What's your favorite? Um, ah, man. I mean, I got to go with Monarch. It just, it's so fitting <laughs> in so many ways. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not like I'm trying to influence the audience here. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, just, you know, and I, like you said, Joe, an iconic endangered species and Monarch fits so well for this chick. That's, that's definitely my favorite. Um, but yeah, Aurora is great too. I mean, that, that's my photo there of when I saw it in Big Sur. Um, no, I'm just kidding. That's definitely not I my know. photo. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot. I mean, these are all great names. Like, yeah. Yeah, there was a funny story with the crew. Um, Darren was the only one who was able to see it. We were all stuck down under the fog. He was up on the ridge feeding out, providing carcasses to the condors at night. And he's been rubbing it in how he was the only one who got to see the Aurora and Big Sur. <laughs> we were all stuck in the fog. We didn't see much. But, it was, uh, yeah, it was so cool, guys. I wish you could have seen it. I mean... <laughs> yeah, pretty unique. I mean, I don't know the, the, soup, the full background about it, but I know it hadn't happened in or a very long time or if ever, I don't know. Um, so yeah, that name, I mean, that chick was literally born right around when that, when that happened. So kind of cool. So we have 128 reporting. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the election here, uh, <laughs> but the uh, news counter, area. 129 reporting folks. We're getting close. I've all I think that's just reporting. about everyone since the stat, <laughs> since the host and panelists cannot vote. I think uh, I think that's everybody. Yeah, probably. Yeah, we're at 131. We have 139 participants. I'll give another 30 seconds. <laughs> well, you think this is the presidential race here? I know. <laughs> With 80% of the precincts reporting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. I know it's kind of exciting. I'm the only one who's able to who, see it here. Just who are we projecting? to be a shocker. Win. That's all I'm saying. All right. I think we've we've hit our 131, Mike. I think we're uh what do you think? We'll announce it? the results right after these messages. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> First, we're gonna go to a two minute of commercials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 131. It's still a 131 reporting, so. Are we ready? Are we going to end it? Drum roll. <laughs> Here we go. Oh. Aurora it is. Very cool. Nice wow. going, Darren. Awesome. I, I was with Darren. I thought Monarch was going to take it. Yeah, he was, you know, Darren was really, really kind of <laughs> trying to get us to be okay, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> Check it with me for the next chick naming. <laughs> Aurora it is. Very cool. Hey, yeah. that fits, man. I mean, it's pretty rare celestial event, right? Awesome. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. We have a name. Uh, so tune yeah. in and definitely um, keep watching Aurora on the Nest Cam. And again, we won't know the gender um, until we get that chicken hint when we, after it fledges and we capture it at the release site. Like we've done in the we folks who've um, followed our chats for the past few years. Once we catch them, we send in a blood sample for DNA. You can't tell condors apart when they're young, um, or even when they're older, um, apart physically looking at them. So the blood test is what tells us what gender it is. Um, so yeah, we'll find out probably hopefully in like another nine, ten months, we'll know the gender. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, this is uh, it's condor nesting season, and we have some seasonal stickers available. Um, Jane and Meredith wanted to pass this on. Really cool uh, stickers commemorating the chick. You can see there the photo on the right. Um, and then, of course, the nest on the left. This is our iconic nest and a great way to commemorate it. You can 
The artwork is courtesy of Morgan Lewis. Um, she's on Instagram at Ripple in the Wild. And you can find it on our Ventana WS store. And um, again, follow us on social media. Um, a lot of these videos you saw today were posted on social media on Instagram and Facebook um, or Twitter, sometimes on YouTube. And again, you can learn more about us um, at our website listed right there. Not only about our counter program, but our education program. Um, you can watch the cams. It's just full of a lot of great information. And of course, you want to become a member or donate um, or sign up to receive our emails and just shop all the cool merchandise. Come check us out. All right, Mike. I think we're at question time. Well, yeah, uh, I've been pretty busy answering <laughs> questions, uh, but but there's a few more that I'll 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 be sure to hit. Uh, uh, Kathy from Santa Cruz wants to know: uh, Do we try and tag all condors born in the wild? If so, at what age do we tag them? Yeah, um, we try to tag them at, uh, yeah, all, all wild nestlings at this point are still getting tagged. And we wait to tag them um, for Ventana Wildlife Society. We wait to tag them when they're at least a year old or close to a year old, once they are strong enough to make it back to the release site and fly on their own. Um, some of the other release sites, Pinnacles or Southern California, if they have the opportunity to go in the nest right before fledging, they'll attach a tag. But more often than not, folks are capturing the birds at about a year in age. And again, some birds are take a little longer. Um, you know, it's up to, we have to have a little luck on our side to catch these birds. So um, yeah, it's around, I would say right there in around a year, we get these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really as close to that as we can, we can trap them up. Um, and yeah. again, the transmitters are just really important to track survival of each individual bird, um, you know, which ties into the, you know, monitoring the, the lead threat, which is the number one threat to condor survival. And also, you know, with all the work you're doing, Mike, so um, with non-lead outreach. So yeah, it's, it all ties together. It's important to know which individual is which. And sometimes uh, we can see a non-tagged individual flying, usually a very young bird that has that has uh, just left the nest. So it does take some time to, to uh, get the tags on the birds. Um, uh, Darren, could I tap you as our trio expert uh, for this next question uh, from, uh, from Joanne? Um, she wants to know, what does the third bird do? You know, what, what are, how do they divide up the, the duties around the house? Uh, any, whether it's a male, male female trio or a female female male trio uh who does what and any trends that you've noticed from your observations of these of these birds yeah it's it, it seems like it can be like from our observations it seems like a pretty equal contribution to to incubating and then brooding and feeding um from from all three birds in a trio um we'll we'll see all three birds take turns at the nest, uh, incubating the egg and um, and coming to visit the chick and and bringing it food and and which is great. I mean, it's just another like well, for the chick, it's just another bird that's like there to take care of it and 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 uh, bring it the resources it needs until it's able to fledge and fend for itself. Um, so yeah, really, all three birds take take equal parts in contributing um, to to the nest care. And typically, when we see um, like four trios in their nests, we it's it's pretty typical we, we only see like one bird at the nest caring for the chick at a time sometimes another bird will be nearby but it like won't be right there in the nest with another adult and the chick um so yeah they're all three birds are contributing but it, it does seem to mostly be like a one at a time sort of thing so they have it choreographed pretty well uh <laughs> joe i remember a a time, uh, oh, this was a few years ago when a gray, gray whale washed ashore and one lucky chick from a trio really fed very nicely that year. Uh, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, it had three birds feeding it around the clock. And it was one of the largest nestlings we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it was, so location it was is good primo, too. Primo whale blubber. 
Yeah, it, it pays to have your nest close to a beached whale, I guess. So. Yeah, it was it was a hardy chick, put it that way. That's the nice way to describe it. <laughs> it was a whale of a chick. So <laughs> the the condor cams are really uh, really exciting, uh, and there are a lot of people out there keeping tracks of uh, keeping track of individuals by number and name, and oftentimes we miss some of the birds because they don't appear on camera. Maybe they don't appear very often or or maybe they're just taking a break and we just don't see them for a long time. And and naturally we get concerned if we don't see a bird for a long time. Do you get concerned? And we're wondering, is there some little special hangout place off camera that these birds go to? Are there are we keeping track? track of birds that are not appearing on camera? Uh, that question uh, that question comes from uh, Scott. Go for it, Darren. Yeah, I mean, the, the cameras have, have really been a great tool for us to, to watch the birds so closely. But I mean, outside of that, um, the, the radio transmitters that each bird wears, we, we keep track of them that way pretty heavily. I mean, I, we've been doing that for a long time since before we had the live cams and, and that that's really helped us figure out where birds are when they're not at the areas where we have these live streaming cams going. Um, and then GPS transmitters as well. That's, that's been also like a, um, relatively newer way. Um, especially like more recently, there's been a lot more we've been doing with GPS data, but we're able to keep pretty close tabs on, on birds that are wearing GPS transmitters. Not every bird has one. Um, a good portion of the flock does, but but yeah, that that gives us a good indication of where uh, where not only those birds are that are wearing GPS transmitters, but also the birds that aren't because they're so social. Um, a lot of times these birds are spending time together and grouping up and, and flying off. So between the radio transmitters, GPS transmitters, and then the live streaming cameras, those those are really the best ways we have for monitoring birds. Um, yeah. Yes, and and your volunteer crew is is very impressive. Uh, yes. They go out with the tracking gear and and they don't always go down the coast. Uh, sometimes uh, you'll send them on other uh, routes and other places that are far from the cameras. And those are other opportunities to to document birds that might be away from the camera, so that we can. Uh, keep tabs on on everybody. Uh, hey, Mike, I'm going to interrupt you. I want to hear what you've been up to. What I've been up to? Yeah, I think folks want to hear what you've been up to. <laughs> well, uh, you know, yesterday I just got back from a trip uh, from uh, to Hatchapi. And so uh, a lot of driving and a lot of visiting with uh, a couple of ranchers and, and several hunters. And so we're getting non-lead ammunition out, and and I have someone that helps out with that, Derek Whitmer, and uh, he helped you out with the condor pins uh, in the last couple of weeks. But he's also looking at the maps that Evan makes, and he's looking at different uh, land parcels and figuring out where the condors are feeding. and And he's working in San Benito County and some of these other areas that are heavily visited by condors. And, and so he's identifying properties for non-lead outreach. And so a lot of using the condors to help us prioritize which landowners we reach. And then also a lot of traveling to make those uh, connections to the non-lead ammunition uh, a lot easier. And so that's what we're working on, just really trying to uh, sort of get those corners where the, the condors are, are feeding and, and uh, fill in the map uh, as far as our exposure and outreach. Yeah, big kudos to you two. You guys are doing an awesome job. Yeah, so a very involved uh, non-lead outreach program. Uh, I can transition from that very complicated uh, program to a very simple question. We've been uh, debating the color of condor eggs here in the chat. Uh, they kind of looked uh, blue and uh, we thought that maybe they might be blue or they might be white. Could you tell us, Joe, what color are condor eggs? Yeah, the, you know, we've seen a, a little bit of a scale on them. I mean, they're all pale, light color, but it goes from a light, lightish blue to a lightish green 
but more often than not, it's a very light green, like a pale green. Um, but it's rare that you ever see a pure white egg. It's, it's always, you know, and it, it's kind of like, just depends on the lighting of the cave you're in. And sometimes it have a bluish appearance to it. But um, if you talk to Mike Clark, you know, who we've had on the podcast, who works at LA Zoo and He's probably seen more condor eggs than any human on earth. Um, he could tell you the color. He would probably say light green. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And Sue would like to know, uh, do the condors show any side effects from the vaccine? Or, or is it maybe just a little early to tell? Um, there have been some minor, um, similar to when humans get vaccines, uh, there'll be some irritation at the actual injection site and so we've been monitoring that um and yeah i mean it's basically just uh we haven't seen anything serious uh in the wild birds um so yeah the trots you know that was the purpose of the trials to make sure we were not having any adverse side effects um so fortunately um yeah they've just had some stuff happening at the injection site but again that's why we hang on to those birds a week after that final booster so amy can get one last look at that injection site just to make sure they're all clear and um, yeah, and so far, uh, yeah, so the four we just vaccinated were got uh, cleared by Amy and that's exactly what she's looking for is looking for side effects. So that's that's high on our, you know, and every bird's different. Um, so we're not, you know, we did these pretty thorough trials but you just never know. And that's why we have to have close eyes on them when we're doing the vaccines. That's why SPCA, the site we have and the pen setup we have is really perfect um, for what we need to do. And uh, again, took a lot of people to come together to make it happen. And, uh, but yeah, you know, the vaccines are always risky, just like, you know, um, when we all went through coronavirus. So it's, uh, it's a mixed bag sometimes, but fortunately not, uh, there's no adverse reactions. Mm -hmm. uh, Darren, true or false? Do condors no. have vocal cords? Uh, and, uh, what can you tell us about what the sounds of the song of the condor? What can you tell us about what condors sound like? It's a song. The, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the song of the condor. That's great. I'm going to use that next anytime I talk about condor vocal, vocalizations from now on. Um, they they do have a a vocal apparatus. It's not it's not like our vocal cords, um, but yeah, they don't they don't really have. Um, a way of producing a lot of like tonal sounds like like other birds do it's it's really a lot of their sounds are more like hisses and and grunts um and they kind of we notice those especially like the hisses um they use those when they're aggravated or or when they're um like in dominance disputes or or food disputes like carcasses you know we we really start hearing those kind of like hissing noises and and then the the grunting too i mean like is a part of that as well um they also grunt when they defecate which i always enjoy it's that's fun um <laughs> um but yeah it's mostly just a series of like hissing and grunting sounds that's that's the song of the condor song of the condor not exactly well, what you were probably hoping for but <laughs> yeah yeah depends on what your cup of tea is you know uh, let's do one last question uh looking at the population uh we always look at the number of condor deaths in a given year. And does that match up with the number of wild or the number of birds fledging from wild nests? And how is the population growing based on those numbers? We look at that year to year. So the question is, you know, how are we doing in that regard? And how would we be doing if we were to remove lead poisoning from that equation? Would we be seeing um, a population that's trending toward producing more birds than we lose every year? Yeah, that's a great question. That's the number one question we contend with. You know, every year we evaluate our program. Um, and so, yeah, I think the good news is the silver lining is that, you know, I, we can start by saying that um, it's probably break even right now, maybe slightly negative population growth. And, um, but we do know based on some of the modeling that we've done with uh, UC Santa Cruz with Meyer Finkelstein and, and um, that group is that if we can put a, a small dent into the lead mortality and reduce that, it will have a huge impact. It could put us into the positive growth rate category. So that's why we're putting all our chips in what 
you're doing, Mike, you know, with the non-lead outreach um, and getting ammo out there, because we know that is single-handedly the biggest limiting factor. And um, and if you look at our annual mortality, a lion's share of it is lead related, lead or lead related. So it's um, pretty clear to us and you don't have to even have a fancy model to, to know that, you know, if we get rid of the lead, that these birds are going to prosper. So it's, uh, it's become, you know, for Ventana, that's a very simplified way to look at it, but it is at the end of the day, that really is why we've shifted so many resources towards the non-lead outreach aspect of condor recovery. Yes. And I always appreciate how Ventana has done that, uh, created so much effort towards uh, reducing this major threat toward the self-sustainability of the population. We're really doing all we can for uh, to, to, to combat lead poisoning and even looking for additional grant money to do even more than we're doing now. So, so we're really uh, optimistic about the future and, and how we might positively impact condors. I appreciate everyone who's uh, attended. We look forward to the next condor chat. June 27, and uh, we we do uh, we do want to correct that Pacific Standard Time. We, it, we're we're going to be Pacific Daylight Time at 4 p.m. Pacific uh, Daylight Time. Thank you, uh, thank you, Leslie, uh, for 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 catching that next Condor chat. And Kelly, before we say goodbye, uh, there there's a question about Condor Canyon. Um, is there an update on when people might be able to see Condor? I, I, it seems like I should say that with an echo. Condor Canyon, Canyon. Is there an update on when we might be able to see Condor Canyon? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. I appreciate that question. Um, you know, this project is quite a huge undertaking. Um, not not necessarily in the length of the film, although it did end up. Um, at 53 minutes, so it does qualify as a feature. Um, but the time involved uh, is, is just been tremendous. We, we started on this project over a year ago and mostly filming. Meredith Evans here on our team did most of the filming. Um, and <clears throat> after we felt like we, we had enough uh, film to, to tell the story that we wanted to tell, then, uh, then it, it really started to pick up in, in effort and and we uh, went out and hired a, a music supervisor to, to select music scores. Um, we, we hired John Wineglass to produce uh, original uh, music composition um, and we hired a professional voiceover actor uh, Catherine Cavadini to do the narration and it's coming together so well. I'm just so 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 thrilled about it. Um, but the the thing about film projects is you you really can't just release them as soon as you're you're done. I mean, unless unless you just want to self uh, distribute and, and and be content with that. We are holding out in in hopes of attracting the attention of a major network. Uh, we plan to submit the the film project to at least a half dozen really good film festivals to try to, uh, you know, again, uh, secure that distribution deal. And until we do so, we have to keep the project in-house and we really can't release it. So I've been sort of hesitant to even talk about it because I'll drive you all crazy. You know, when when can I see it? When can I see it? And, and it could be another year. You know, it, it's really hard to say. Um, but um, my hope is uh, it will go big. It will it will be on some national platform, and uh, we'll be uh, quick to show you and tell you where you can you can go see it. And and then if we do end up self distributing, well then it'll it'll be in our YouTube channel. But we we just won't do that, you know, out the gate. We want to put some effort into uh, trying to get a broader uh, distribution. And uh, it's just a great story. It's a true story. It's all filmed in very high resolution, 6K footage. Uh, it's just, it's gonna be fantastic. Yeah, yeah so you're sure. saying it's, it's worth waiting for. Uh, uh, wasn't there a trailer or a little sneak peek uh, on our website at one point? 
Yeah, we, we put a teaser on the website. It's under uh, the media category, under films, and um, the teaser is actually soon to be replaced with the trailer with uh, uh, Catherine Cavadini's voice. So it, it will be a little different and will, will match more of, of how the project is, is shaping up. Um, so yeah, you can check that out on the website, see the rest of the credits and who all is involved in it. And uh, yeah, thanks again for asking. Sounds great. Thank you, Kelly. And, and Joe, I'll let you take it home. Joe, let's keep that zero and mortality intact here until the next Condor chat, at least. I'm with you there, buddy. Yeah, let's hope uh, for stay out of trouble. That's our goal, um, you know, to keep them alive and uh, keep them growing. And uh, yeah, again, it's it's just been a last, God, this last six months has just been an incredible ride with, you know, all the, the different things have been thrown our way. Um, so I can't state it enough. Thank you, you all. For your support thanks to everyone i get to work with and all these awesome partners you know it's just been an, we can't do it without you so keep coming and checking out the chats we love all the questions we love all the uh excitement and um we just love to share what we're seeing out there it's a pretty incredible species and uh, we're all you know i definitely feel honored to be working with them and uh working with everybody i get to work with so hand it over to you kelly thank you everybody yeah, thanks for coming again, and uh, we'll see you next time on June 27th. Bye, everyone.